Welcome to our Outstanding Program Awards webinar. I'm going to give everybody just a minute or two to get logged in before we get started. We'll try to kick things off about 12.02. Welcome to those of you just jumping on. I'm going to give everyone just another minute to get logged in before we kick things off. Glad you could be with us today. All right, welcome to our final Fall Forum Wednesday webinar. Um, it's been our pleasure through the month of October to host this series of webinars at noon each, um, each Wednesday to talk about a variety of different topics of interest to school foundations across our state. And I'm really excited today to get to present our final webinar, which is highlighting the achievements of our Outstanding Program Award winners for this year. Um, Outstanding Program Awards are awarded each year by um, our out, uh, Oklahoma School Foundations Network. And um, the process is a nomination. You get to nominate a school foundation program. Um, it's read by our panel of judges and ranked. And then our awards recognize sort of our top vote getters. And this year, we're really excited to recognize three fantastic programs um, that encourage excellence in their school systems in some very different ways. Um, we have two programs that sort of focus on literacy and one that focuses on um, community partnerships. So, so excited to have you with us to hear about those today. Um, my name is Katie Leffel. I'm the director of the Oklahoma School Foundations Network. And I wanted to do a quick intro into a few different things that our program does, just in case you're not familiar with us. Um, on the screen is my contact information and a list of sort of some of the different um, services that I can provide for your school foundation free of charge. And I just would encourage you to take a look and to reach out to me if there's some way that I can support your foundation. Um, I love getting to collaborate with school foundation leaders across the state and would welcome a call from you anytime if I could be of service to you. But today, as I mentioned, we are here to focus on the Outstanding Program Awards and our three program award winners this year are the Trojans Read the Way Bookmobile from the Jinx Public Schools Foundation, the Community and Schools Together Initiative from the Putnam City Schools Foundation, and the Get Books Not Twix um, program from the Grove Education Foundation for Excellence. And so today I have several guests joining me um, to talk about their programs, and I want to introduce you briefly to them and let them say hello, um, and then we'll kind of jump right into our program. So First, I'd like to welcome from Jinx, um, the Jinx Public Schools Foundation Executive Director, Elizabeth Embody. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. Thanks Glad to be here. With us. And you. along with her, she has brought Eric Fox, who is the Jinx High School um, Associate Principal, and he's going to help share today about their program. Hi, Eric. Hello there. Glad to be with you guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us. And from Putnam City, I have um, two guests as well. And the Putnam City Schools Foundation President, Jennifer Seal. Hi, Jennifer. Hello, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm tardy. No, you're good. You're right on time. And joining her is the Foundation Community Relations Liaison, Kelly Sushi. Hi, Kelly, how are Hi, you? Thank you? I'm great. Thanks for having us today. And you're also going to get to hear from the Grove Education Foundation for Excellence, um, although they're going to be um, joining us via a recording that we did um, a little bit ahead of time. They had a scheduling conflict for today. Um, but you'll get to hear from them as well, from their um, foundation president, Christy Wallace, and from Miranda Ward, who is a library at the Grove Upper Elementary School. So we'll go ahead and jump right in, and we're going to start um, by talking about the Trojans Read the Way program. And so I'm going to just pass it over to Elizabeth and Eric to tell us about this wonderful program. 
Great. Thanks so much. So first, I just want to say how grateful we are to be recognized with an outstanding program award. It's quite an honor and um, we appreciate so much that the Oklahoma Schools Foundation Network um, recognizes excellence in education for our school foundations. But to start, I thought I would share just a few facts about Jinx Public Schools for those who aren't familiar. Um, we're located just south of Tulsa and we um, account we take up about 40 square miles, as you can see. There's a little over 12,000 students um, at 10 sites. We're the 11th largest public school district. And um, in this slide right here, you'll see is our high school campus. Um, one of the things we're kind of um, noted for is that we have a planetarium on our high school campus, which is pretty cool. Um, Anyway, so this is just kind of a, an aerial shot of our high school campus. But I just wanted to give you a few fun facts about, or just a few facts about Jinx Public Schools. And then the next slide, just a little overview about the Jinx Public Schools Foundation. So this kind of shows you um, the impact we're making at Jinx Public Schools and, and the student impact. Um, several years ago, probably about 10 years ago, we shifted our focus from funding um, classroom grants and moved to funding more um, academic grants um, that impacted large groups of students. Um, our PTAs were very fortunate, are able to um, help with classroom needs. So this is kind of the scope of our work at Jinx Public Schools. Um, our largest program is uh, STEM learning, but you can see we have a variety of different programs um, that um, reach a broad section of our students. Um, I work with our um, superintendent and um, teaching and learning staff to identify those programs every year and um, our board votes on them in June. But a deviation from these programs actually is the Trojans Read the Way program. And I wanna talk just a minute about how that funding initiative came to the Jinx Public Schools Foundation. Um, we, every year, pre-COVID, we would go with the Board of Education on a board showcase tour. And we were at the high school um, one afternoon and our, um, I got to hear about the Trojans Read the Way initiative. It was a grassroots initiative from some of our educators who felt like literacy wasn't, literacy needs weren't being um, assessed, when weren't being met or for some of our students. Um, and they, they saw that need and they had a, a vision and a dream. Um, what I think is notable and what I wanna share with other foundation leaders is, although this isn't something we originally thought we could fund, um, when I heard about this need, um, because I'm a fundraiser, I knew that this was something that our, our population, our, our, our donors, our patrons would understand. It was tangible. They, would, they could see the benefit immediately of why this was something that was needed in, Jinx, in the Jinx School District. And so I brought it to the board and said, um, I think this is something worthwhile for us to look into. And, and, and one of the big reasons too is because I knew we could raise the funds for it. I knew that our donors would understand and wrap their heads around it pretty quickly. I'll talk about how we raised the funds later on. Um, but I just wanted to say that this was kind of the, it, this was us always kind of being out there and working with administrators and just listening to their needs, even though we, we determine our funding needs at the end of our fiscal year every year, and that's pretty much what we're funding. This was helpful to kind of see something that our educators felt like was important and that I knew um, there would be a connection with our donors. And I knew that they had the capacity to donate. And because those two things, um, because of those two things we were successful but this right now i want to share a quick video this is the video that was played um, at our auction where we raised the funds and um, to uh, to share some information about the trojans read the way program when a kid gets a new book their eyes light up you see the, the spark in their eye, you see the joy, you see the excitement. When a kid gets a new book in his hand, the possibilities are endless. We have amazing libraries at our sites. We have amazing classroom libraries at our sites. And so those kids get to read during the year. But we have kids that aren't being served, especially in the summer. Kids who have access to books in their home um, see great gains and increases in their reading levels. And if we can provide those resources to them in the summertime, especially when they may not have easy access to programs, to books in the summer, then it's a win.
the best feeling is when you're driving up to the complex and they're waiting for you and they see you and you see them run off to go get everybody else and then like, you just get swarmed with kids it is like the best reaction and then you know putting the right book into the kid's hand and watching them immediately go sit down and they could be at the pool or they could be playing basketball and they're sitting there reading the book when it's like 100 degrees outside it's just it's, a, it's an awesome amazing feeling I think it meant a lot because we see the clothes are worn and, you know, the coat may be a little bit too small. And so to have something that, yeah, that is just theirs and is new and just to kids, they just want something that's theirs. We want kids to own books. We want kids to build their own libraries. We want kids who may or may not be reading in the summer to feel that pride of they have their own books. new bookmobile would mean so much um, because it means that we can start to expand the program. We want to get books in the hands of, of as many kids as we possibly can um, and the bookmobile will allow us to do that. The bookmobile will be a convenience because we can actually stock it with books. We want to have a freezer for the popsicles and kids can come on. We want to have benches inside so that kids can sit in, you know, kind of a cool space and read and look at books. We want it to be the coolest bookmobile around. And I think that we can make it happen. What we did on such a limited basis with such limited resources was so empowering and so exciting that if we have a dedicated bookmobile, where can you go from there? It's kind of mind-boggling. I don't even know if you put it into words. It, it would be it'd be huge. And I just think we're not just impacting kids, we're impacting families, we're impacting our community. It goes on so much more beyond just putting books in the kids' hands and setting them up for success. It will have an impact on those kids for the rest of their lives if they learn to be good readers now and they continue to read during the summer. If you want to give to something that's going to have long-term impacts, this is what to give to. Okay, thanks, Katie. And if you'll go to the next slide, and um, and then Mr. Fox, I'll let you take it from here and just talk about, you know, how it started. Sure. Um... So I've been in education for 30 years, and this is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen take place. And really, I can take very, very little credit for it. The only thing I did was, as an administrator, recognize that we had a very passionate group of teachers who came with an idea. And all I said is, boy, I don't know. Let's see what we can do. And, and I repeated that phrase multiple, multiple times. Um, we, we have a, a, a brand new... Um, we had a brand new media center that was built, beautiful facility built with bond dollars. It was wonderful. And we had some teachers that said, this is so great. Why is it closed all summer? So the first idea was we need to open up the media center and we'll staff it with volunteers every Wednesday. And we'll have kids be able to come in and check out books and have meetings and learn about uh, college admissions and different things like that. But then from there, the question was, well, what do we do about the kids that can't get here? And they can't drive. They, it's an equity issue, right? They can't get to campus. They can't come and access the, the library. So it's okay. Let's take books out into the community. Uh, and so that's where the idea of the bookmobile was, was born, was how do we get books in the hands of kids over the summer? So the first summer we loaded up with, you saw the crates of books and the plastic tables. Um, and um, they were the crates of books from our library. And we went out and we thought that we were going to have high school kids show up at the apartment complexes and ask for a popsicle and a book. And we we're going to use our scanner and check them out. Well, after the first week, we said, that ain't it. That's not what's going to happen here. Because what was happening were younger students who were coming from the apartment complexes and saying, well, I want a book. Well, we didn't have books from the high school media center we could check out to them. So very quickly, we shifted gears and, and um, started taking donations and started getting hands in the books of younger kids and you can you can see what our setup looked like it was so hot in the summertime we bought a canopy uh, and we'd set that up in the apartment complexes um, there were four apartment complexes that we utilized we'd set up our plastic tables there we would get donations of books or books that teachers went out and bought um, for kids that were high interest and high engagement materials and and um, you know we we'd be there every Tuesday and Thursday on a set schedule four different apartment complexes we'd tear down 
uh, load it back up and go to the next one. Um, and um, it was so successful that we decided to do a holiday run. Um, and we also took hot chocolate. And this is one of our um, apartment complexes that's known for um, the Burmese population. We have a large refugee population um, from uh, refugees from Myanmar. And um, there were old, there were over 100 people that turned out at just this one stop. And so very quickly, it shifted from getting students access to high school media library books to how do we get um, books in the hands and the hearts and the homes of our community and, and our and our students district wide. So um, that's what you see in this picture was our, our holiday run. Um, and after that first summer, like uh, Elizabeth said, we were we were just sharing um, the experiences of, of what we had seen and, and the power of some of the stories that we'd seen like a a young man who was there every single Tuesday and Thursday. And about the fourth fourth uh, time that we had been there, he said, do you guys have any books in Spanish? Because my mom doesn't read um, in English and I really want her to have a new book. Um, and we didn't have any books in Spanish that day, but by golly, by the next Tuesday we did, right? Um, because again, these teachers just started going out and, and, and getting books and getting donations and stuff like that. And um, so it was the power of those stories that Elizabeth and others heard, and, and they wanted to come alongside us. So if you want to look at it, uh, Elizabeth just said, hey, if, if we can do this together, the next slide shows um, kind of the budget that, that Elizabeth helped us identify and come up with. So Elizabeth, if you want to talk to that. Okay, sure. So yes, yeah, so super impactful once we you know, saw those pictures and saw the impact that, um, that our educators are making um, just on their own and just hearing their stories, really the stories made a huge difference on um, the individual stories of each student. Um, so once it was easy to say, yes, we're gonna, we would love to learn more about it. So I asked them for a budget proposal. And so um, it was, um, we identified that it'd be about $26,000 to, um, for the whole program, you know, to take a old school bus and retrofit it, take out, you saw the picture in the video of the old school bus, take out the, the seats. And then we have a Jinx family who owns a business that does custom wraps. And so they were able to give us a really good deal. Um, we'll show you what it looks like. Um, and then we, you know, we need a place to put it. You know, if we're gonna work so hard to make an incredible bookmobile, we need a canopy. And so we try to anticipate those costs and, um, and uh, Mr. Fox uh, worked with his team and said so we decided it'd be about $26,000. So you can see on, on top, I added, actually the wrap came in at 3,500. Retrofitting came in a little bit more. It also includes that freezer and a generator. The carport was a little bit more um, miscellaneous cost. And then now one thing, um, so we're not at our 26,000, but um, I think we might be there because now we, we need electricity. We hadn't anticipated that, but we need electricity or where the canopy is so the generator can always stay charged and it'll be ready to go. So, you know, um, it, it was the, the great thing is the next slide, Katie, I'll, sh I'll show you um, is um, a, just a, a visual of our auction. We're very fortunate to have an annual auction that um, usually we have around 650 to 700 guests. Um, we do um, a live auction, a silent auction. And in the middle of our live auction, we usually do what we call a call for cash. We identify a need. We had been funding um, fundraising for STEM for many years. So um, we played the video that you just saw to that crowd. Um, we raised more than 26,000. I had a donor that matched um, matched so donations that year. I think we raised close to 48,000. Um, so the remaining of the funds, and um, we were very, you know, transparent about it. What was what not what was not needed for funding the bookmobile would be um, used for the programs that you saw listed. Uh, um, listed previously, but it was easy to do. I mean, 15 minutes, took 15 minutes to really raise those funds. So, and we're very lucky to have this annual event that people um, are eager to donate towards. So. Elizabeth, that's so true, but it's also, I mean, good work on your team. You know, that video, I don't live in Jinx. I want to write you a check right now to make <laughs> mobile dreams come true. So you guys did a fantastic job of presenting it. And it, it just shows too, you know, Mr. Fox, that this really came, like you said, from teachers' hearts. And I think people can really see that. You know, they wanted it so badly that teachers were driving a van around with crates in the back. And so 
you know, that's pretty hard to overlook as far as level of passion for the teachers too. Yeah, and if, and I know we're um, getting close to our time, but if you want to go through the next slides there, it shows what sure. the bookmobile looked like, because like you said, it, so every Tuesday and Thursday, it, would, it was about a six hour process from about 11 o'clock till 5, 5.15, 5.30 to, to load and unload the, the van because we had to take it back to transportation every day. We didn't get to keep the van all summer. Um, so we had to go pick it up. We had to load it. We had to unload it. Um, and, and we had to load the ice chest with popsicles and stuff like that. And so it was quite a process and quite a commitment. But um, we, we took a special education bus um, because it has a lift on it. And that way, this bus is accessible to anybody um, who wants to get on the bookmobile. They installed an extra um, generator that you saw, as well as air conditioning units, because, again, we're, we're taking them to apartment complexes and neighborhoods in the summertime. So um, and, and the climate control condition helps keep the books all, uh, in the summertime taken care of and that sort of thing. So you can see that's the ribbon cutting that the foundation um, gave us when we rolled it out for the first trip. Uh, the next slide there um, shows uh, what it looks like with the wrap. Um, that's that's the wrap that was that was created for it. And then our team was part of that process with the logo. And I, I don't think you see it there, but our, you can see maybe in the in the center panel in the back, that, that's the Jinx Public School Foundation logo as well. So all of our materials, since this is a partnership program, always has the Trojans Read the Way and the foundation logo as, as all of our promotional materials. Um, if you wanna look at the next slide, um, that's, those are shelves that our, our carpenters, our district carpenters built specifically after meeting with the team to, to retrofit the, the bus. And you can see those there. Um, and the next slide shows some students actually on the bus. And again, you know, initially this whole deal was how do we get um, high school students to read over the summer? And, and it quickly shifted to, to lower grades, but it's been okay because uh, especially this past year when we were able to expand and instead of just going to five apartment complexes on one side of the river, Jinx, the community of Jinx is separated by the Arkansas River. So the first year, all we could do is go to some of our lower socioeconomic apartment complexes in, in Tulsa. Uh, and, and that was the only area we were serving. But since we got the bookmobile, we're able to expand to both sides of the river and serve um, communities and neighborhoods in, in Jinx proper as well as in Tulsa. And, and so truly during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, it truly became a district outreach initiative that the foundation had a huge partnership in. Um, so you can see some of the kids there. Um, the next slide. Um, just just shows them, you know, coming to the bus and and just we have apartment complexes that we partner with the managers. Uh, they put it on their social media feeds. Neighborhoods put it on their social media feeds. Trojans read the way is coming. We put up signs um, so so they know when we're going to be there every every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and I think the next slide is similar. Yeah, just just more pictures of, of the kids. And you can see the, the big thing, there, there's one of our slides in the neighborhood um, that we put out the day before that, you know, bookmobile is gonna stop here tomorrow. And then we always have popsicles uh, in, the, in the freezer. And um, next year, next summer, we're hoping we can work with our child nutrition to expand some of our child nutrition um, feeding, summer feeding programs. Couldn't do that this summer, but we're making plans to hopefully make that innovation as well. Um, and if you look at the last slide that we have here, just kind of gives an overview of a summary of the numbers that we had. Uh, again, going to all sides of the, of the district, all locations of the district, it was a huge community service um, outreach to our community. And it just would not be possible without um, just Elizabeth recognizing this great idea and saying, hey, how can we help? And so we're so appreciative to our foundation, but then also, to, to your network as well for recognizing this as a special program. Um, you know, the, the financial uh, award that comes with that is gonna be used to purchase more books. So we're always updating and, and having relevant, engaging materials for students to, uh, to have and, and books that they get to keep. They don't, they don't turn them back into us. We had one, one, little, one little boy, he was about sixth grader, came to us. He'd been there the first day, he came back the second day. Um, and he brought the books back and he said, here, my dad says, I got to give these back to you and said, no, you get to keep those. He said, well, we don't have the money to pay. My dad says, we don't have the money to pay for them if I tear them up. So he was thinking it was like the library system where, where he had to check it out. And dad was trying to be responsible and say, hey, we're not going to be able to pay for this if something happens to the book. And one of our 
teachers did a great job. She said, look, I hope you take care of the book, but it's yours. And so, you know, if you tear it up, it's on you, but you get to keep it. And just that, that was just, just, you could see the look in his face that I get to have this book for myself. This is something I can keep myself. Um, that was just something that had never entered his mind. So we appreciate everybody who has helped us with this and support of this. Uh, and we're just excited to see how it grows in the future. Thank you guys so much. I've loved hearing about your program. And if you have questions um, about the Trojans Read the Way program, you can put them in the Q&A and the chat and we will circle back around to those sort of at the end of our presentation. Um, but I'm gonna hand it over now to talk a little bit about the Community and Schools Together initiative and let Jennifer and Kelly kind of speak to how they uh, uh, saw a need in their community um, and or saw a way to help the foundation um, match up school needs with community resources. So Jennifer, I'd love for you to jump in. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you um, to the Foundation for Excellence for recognizing this program. I was so grateful that um, the committee chose us uh, because in part, I'm happy for the opportunity to share this with people around our state because I really think it's um, replicable uh, and customizable to the various communities. Awesome. Next slide. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't know if you wanted me to just say it. No. Um, I can't find a great place for this. Okay, um, I thought it was a great idea for Elizabeth to have some facts about the district because you should recognize who your audience is and why would you know who Putnam City is? Um, we are the oldest school district in the state of Oklahoma. I'm super proud of that as a history teacher. And we serve mostly kids, uh, kids in Northwest Oklahoma City, parts of Bethany, and all of the children in the city of War Acres. So it's about 19,000 students right now. Of course, that varies. Um, we have 27 different schools and I'm very proud to say that we have arts in all of our elementaries right now and of course middle and high school. Our foundation was founded in 1987 and has donated three and a half million dollars or so to the district. Um, we're not a very big operation, but we're probably bigger than a lot of other local school foundations. And so that does afford us the opportunity to implement some programs that maybe smaller places can't do or all volunteer run places can't. And so I'm eager to support any community that wants to try this and figuring out how you can do it without having paid staff. So um, what I learned as uh, the foundation's director for the past several years is I've been a classroom teacher and I knew what was going on from that perspective. Um, but it, when you are getting this kind of overview of the of the district, I, I learned some very important things. And my counterpart here, Kelly, can um, chime in on this as well, because she's been a teacher and a principal in our school district and, and can has unique insight. But what I was able to see is that our principals went to school to learn how to be a principal and that was a small chunk of what they were actually doing in the classes or in their buildings. They were spending a lot of time being counselors and resource officers, procurement officers, um, pastors, all kinds of community liaison efforts that they were doing. And um, they're certainly happy to do it. They're grateful to do it. But I, I, I felt like it was an overwhelming piece of their job when they're also supposed to be taking care of kids and staff members and, and evaluating people and being pedagogic specialist and curriculum specialist. So seeing that coupled with the fact that there were plenty of people who come up to me regularly when they find out what I do for a living and say, you know, uh, we've got to support our teachers. I love our public schools. I'm very grateful um, that I got to have a Putnam City education and I want to be able to help. Um, but they really don't know how to infiltrate, so to speak. And it is kind of awkward if you don't have kids in the actual school to go up to the building and say, hey, I'd like to be a reading buddy. Um, we would, we like that, but it's, it's just not gonna happen, <laughs> especially during COVID. We don't really have a lot of strangers just coming up to the building and, and we're leery of strangers as, as we teach our kids. So I was brainstorming uh, about how we could marry that need that we have as, um, as public schools in, in Putnam City with the desire that I've seen our community has to help us. Kelly, do you want to chime in on any of that from a principal perspective? I'm sorry, I should have said that out loud. 
Oh, no, I, I mean, I just, I, what I know about um, being a former principal and a teacher um, now teachers and principals and counselors are working as hard as they possibly can and just extra time for you know trying to search out resources that so many families have needs for now is just not really um something that is real feasible or if it is that you know it takes away from the other jobs that they're or the hats that they wear on a daily basis so um you know the cast program in my opinion as a, a community resource liaison now is just be that bridge for schools and bridge those opportunities and those resources for families so that um, we can work together with the teachers and the principals and the families to help make those resources um, accessible um, to the schools and to the families. So, um, because I mean, we know teachers and, and principals work really, really hard and they don't always know what great resources are in our communities. I mean, they have a, a familiarity with some of them, but mm -hmm. um, our goal is just to really pair those together so that it makes their job easier. And that's what, what we'd like to say that we're doing through the CAS program. Awesome, thank you. So um, this has been a dream a few years in the making and um, we didn't really have a lot of funding for it initially and wanted to test it out and be slow and deliberate about how we implemented it. And so my first step was to hire an intern. We had her for a semester and she uh, was very effective in getting contacts with various, um, excuse me, local businesses. She worked diligently on getting supplies for, for our STEM labs because we have STEM labs in a lot of elementary schools. And so um, she worked with a couple of auto parts places and hardware stores to get donations to uh, provide just little things that kiddos might need for those STEM labs. Um, so we were super proud of that. And then the publicity that she helped draw to the program in initially, and just in general to help us work out the kinks from an HR perspective and from, from um, an implementation perspective of how we're going to communicate with the schools and how we're going to communicate with the community. I applied for some funding to hire a person and um, she expanded the program. We developed our logo for it. We developed the, the flyer that you saw on a previous slide so that we could better explain, more succinctly explain what we were trying to do. And um, within the last year, then we applied for funding from a different organization that allowed us to expand that year and a half or so pilot program across all of our district. And therefore we've been able to hire three part-time people, one of whom is Kelly, to serve our three feeder patterns. And um, that basically means the high school, middle school, and all of the elementaries that feed in because Putnam City is such a large district. So I, I should have put more on here about what we've been able to accomplish. So that was a failure on my part and I apologize, but we've done a lot of neat things and I'm happy to offline share some more details with people because I think if I were sitting in, um, in your shoes as a, a foundation director, I'd, I'd wonder, well, what is it that you really are doing? You know, what are people asking for and how do you make that happen? Um, one thing that we were successful at last, uh, last year was getting uh, every book into the hands of a child at a particular school, one in English and one in Spanish if needed. Um, so they would be able to take that home and own it. And you heard from Jinx how important, how impactful that is on, um, on a family even not just the kid, but on the entire family to have those that home library. And so we had a big rollout that, that was a, a, a school wide assembly, thanks to a local credit union and the Council on Economic um, Oklahoma's Council on Economic Activities, I can't remember their exact name, helped us with that. And so that was a lot of fun. We had a group of women help set up a clothes closet for middle school girls so that they would have the supplies they needed um, if any accidents occurred throughout the day. Um, we have had a local soccer team support the need for providing nets and balls that had been destroyed um, in, in one of our elementary schools. And then you saw a picture earlier of the refurbishment of a, of a um, shed, a storage shed for one of our elementary schools. Um, Kelly, do you mind? Well, actually, let me look at the slide and give you 
what this actually says. So our next step um, after we've hired these, uh, actually even before we hired the three part-time people, I built a steering committee that is composed of people throughout the community. There are um, our local uh, technology school is involved, the nurses, um, in our district, we've got uh, third party counseling agencies involved, um, DHS is represented, the local police are represented, so we try really hard to build a community of voices who can pro provide the resources that our staff members need um, so that they don't have to go looking when a family says, We've we've got or when a, yeah when a family says we need our clothing washed we we know where to get that done now or if they um, need food we know a couple of different local resources that can provide that um, so now we have the three liaisons and they are housed off site um, to assist us with these efforts the steering committee still meets every month and listens to some of the needs that our liaisons are hearing and they offer oftentimes they offer solutions you know sometimes we have to wait a little bit a few days and figure out if they're able to help or if they've um, had some other connections occur but um, i'm always gratified and frankly almost near tears every single month because of how generous the people are with their time and and with their willingness to donate, even just we had some alumni from our district um, on the call and they donated just a little some candy to pass out to teachers one uh, one year because um, that even though candy doesn't mean that much in the grand scheme of things, but as a teacher, I can tell you we were so glad to have surprises in our boxes like that. So Kelly, do you mind overviewing a couple of the successes you've had, please? Sure. Um, I'd be happy to. One of the things um, that we've done um, through our, um, just through our relationships building with teachers and parents, we found that um, some of our schools aren't having as much booster support as they used to. For instance, um, you know, they used to have parents that would provide meals and things like that for different events. And so we've been able to step in and um, work through a nonprofit in our community to provide meals like for the high school band um, for, for, for a band competition because you know they were parents were having to step up and do that and and they weren't really having the funds to do that and so we had um the, the city center if you're familiar with oklahoma city city center an amazing um nonprofit in our area and they um they provided you know 70 meals for the band and um, for the Putnam city high school band for their competition day um and then i had another restaurant step up you know he he wasn't able to help that day but then he um offered to do some burgers for their homecoming night because they provide dinner you know for their for their band on homecoming night so we've done um some in the, in the way of that um i've also been um able to connect um some of the elementary schools with um, the city center and, and some mentoring and some reading buddy um, initiatives there. What we know about kids and especially with COVID is it, we've got a lot of kids that are delayed because they just haven't had the exposure to um, learning opportunities. And so um, schools are really um, hungry for people that will come in and just read with kids um, or sit down and just talk with kids. Um, about, you know, how's your day going and, you know, just different types of um, partnerships there. So we're really um, excited about the opportunities that can come with um, just partnering with some of those nonprofits um, through our schools that can develop those relationships. So because what we know about kids is that it takes more than a parent. It takes more than a teacher to help shape a child. You know, it really takes significant adults that just take an interest in a child. And um, I think that um, a lot of times kids just don't really know how many adults are out there that really do care about them and just want, want to see them succeed. So we're just really in the, the market for just helping um, kiddos and helping families and just doing the most we can to help um, ease their transitions, you know, in life. And that's kind of what we've been doing as we've started out just in the last couple months. We just started in August. So very excited about the opportunities that, that are coming from this um, grant and just from, from the relationships that are happening. That's awesome. 
Um, and really that's, I mean, that's really kind of what the main things we've been doing um, since we started and, you know, it's growing. Um, you know, I think the one thing that I, we've tried to overcome is just making sure teachers understand we're not trying to add to their plate. We're trying to take something off of their plate in making those, um, you know, those connections. And so um, that's slowly uh, growing as well. That's what, uh, Jennifer, I think you're on mute, friend. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I didn't want you all to have to listen to my dog's barking. Um, so uh, because again, I'm trying to look at this from somebody who might be wanting to start this uh, kind of program in the community. I, I thought it would be helpful to have kind of a day to day. Um, our cast liaisons are expected to meet with the principals one on one, either hopefully face to face, but if by phone, if possible, um, or email and begin the conversations of building that rapport explaining the what the CAS program is and then just finding out what their short and long-term goals are. Um, they can do this in a variety of ways. They uh, can survey teachers or have, um, you know, anecdotal conversations with staff as they're walking through the halls, which is one reason we have them housed in various schools as opposed to in the, in the uh, building with me in my offices. Um, and so we're, we're trying to build those relationships with the staff so that they do see what Kelly just said, that we are not hoping to add something. We're trying to take something away, but um, understandably, they might feel that this initial part, you know, of having to give this information, I just would rather just do it myself sometimes. And I get that. But, but I think that as we build the rapport, that's going to change. Um, and then complementary to that aspect is going through the district and really looking for businesses, religious organizations, et cetera, who can build a, a, be a donut of services, a donut of support around each of our schools. Um, that's that's been my vision because I like donuts for a very long time that we really build this group that supports each of those schools that we can pick up the phone and talk to the First Church of the Nazarene and say, would you please provide donuts to the teachers on Friday for teacher appreciation? And they would say yes, or we need 10 people to proctor for the ACT because we offer that in the high school. So just finding different ways that we can alleviate the burden, as Kelly mentioned. So um, I would say that what are some of the what some of the difficulties have been for us? Um, it's just kind of slow, and I, I know that part of that is COVID, but I also know that part of that is just the nature of being in public education right now. Um, I, I recognized the other day that I have been out of teaching in, out of the classroom long enough to recognize it is quite different from it, how it was when I was in um, and the influence, the responsibilities of, on teachers um, have grown in, and they're just so different and that we want to honor that, um, but it, it makes it them maybe even a little bit reticent to receive the support that we're um, offering them. And so getting that buy-in is taking a little bit longer than I expected, frankly. Um, learning the need, the community's resources that you know, there are, there are a lot of um, small groups, small nonprofits who are doing things, but there's not really a lot of codified places where you can find out what they all are. And so my cast liaisons have also been charged with building that Putnam City database, so to speak, which takes time right now for sure on the front end. But those of you in education are familiar with the phrase, go slow to go fast. And so we are going slow here at the beginning so that it will be running like a well-oiled machine next school year. Um, then I think another kind of mind shift, especially for those of us in the fundraising world, um, the, the bookmobile is some, in Jenks is something that donors can look at and be proud of that they helped with. Um, it's tangible, they, it, it's ongoing, um, and it solves a very important need. That's not necessarily what's happening every single week in the CAST program. Some of these needs are small and some of them are ephemeral, like food, for instance. And I can understand where some donors might be reticent to support um, an effort like that because they don't see any long-term benefit. Um, I, of course, can make a very strong case of having, uh, of the importance of, of providing that band, um, the food that they, so that they have a good homecoming meal, uh, which goes back a little bit to what Kelly said again, that 
We want to make sure these kids know that there are people in the community who care about them as individuals and in their lives. And a hot meal does that. I absolutely believe it. So um, if you're looking for donors or if you have donors who are able to see those kinds of things, um, the importance of these small efforts um, and you as a, as a leader in your in your um, industry, in your community, can see that also those efforts are, are important as well, um, then this is definitely a program that would be worth taking on the challenge. Jennifer, thank you and Kelly so much. I mean, I just have to tell you from a former teacher's perspective also, and um, spoiler alert for the rest of the crowd, I know you guys know this because we've talked about it, but I used to teach in Putnam City and I taught on the south end of the district, which back then was definitely a have not section of the district. And there was definitely a have section um, equity was a real issue. And so I love this program simply from the fact that, you know, this is something that um, we've talked about a lot in different school foundation contexts, but sometimes within a district, you have schools that have a lot of parent support and schools that have no parent support. And so I can definitely see um, the CAS program filling an important need at some of those schools where you don't have the coordination um, and the parent support to come in and take care of things like that. So I applaud you guys for using this as a solution to that inequity. So love hearing about that. Um, I'm going to push play really quickly um, for this little short video um, of the Grove Education Foundation for Excellence program. Um, it's about nine minutes, and so when it finishes up, we should have just enough time to take a couple questions and wrap things up right at one. So I'm going to push play. Good afternoon. I'm excited today to get to talk with um, two of our leaders from the Grove Education Foundation for Excellence, their president, Christy Wallace, and a librarian at the Grove Upper um, Elementary School, um, Miranda Ward. And so I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off with Christy. And Christy, I'd love for you just to tell us a little bit about the Grove Education Foundation for Excellence, sort of um, when you got started, a little bit about what you do, just kind of give us some background on your foundation. Sure. Well, we um, actually started in 1997. We didn't even know that the Oklahoma Foundation for Excellence existed at the time. Um, there were about 30 people that came together in our community. Uh, we had a couple of ladies that had been to a grant writing seminar and they said, hey, we don't want to start a foundation, but we think somebody should. And of those 30 people, there were about 10 of us that were on fire. We're like, this is an excellent idea. We have so many amazing educators in our district, but even back then, there was just no funding for them to do creative and innovative projects. So we just were on fire. We had our first fundraiser, we're incorporated um, within just like six months and we'd raised $50,000. So, I mean, we were off and running. Um, and then we found out there's this amazing resource called the Oklahoma Foundation for Excellence. And um, of course we've relied heavily um, on the OFE over the years for guidance and help, but we have had a lot of success and I will say it's due to two things, amazing donors. Our community is so supportive and generous and our amazing educators. So we wouldn't be able to bring in those funds if we didn't have teachers who were out there just truly promoting academic excellence. Um, and that's our mission. Our mission is to promote and encourage academic excellence and grow public schools. And uh, I know we've done that. I know that we've given over $1.2 million to our schools. Um, through our grants to teacher program. We also give each librarian $1,000 each year so that they, we can provide the latest and greatest books for our students to read. So when we got this grant from Miranda for this book vending machine, um, we were just thrilled. We knew that this would really excite children. Um, sadly, we knew that the, the book that the kid might get today out of that vending machine may be the only book that they own. Um, and it has really lived up to our expectations. Those kids are being extra good to try and earn their little golden coin. And, you know, you can see them at the menu machine trying to decide what book they're going to choose. And it has really just been um, a pleasure to watch the success of this grant. And, and I'll say Miranda is out there hustling all the time, getting donations to buy more books. Um, but, you know, people want to support this. They want to support children reading. We all know how important that is to their foundation of education. So it, I'm just thrilled with it. I'm so excited. We appreciate this award from the OFE. Um, and I hope Miranda would tell us a little bit about what she sees as a library and how this has impacted our students. Yeah, Miranda, I would love to hear from you just sort of how you got the idea for this grant, um, what your thoughts were at the outset on how you were going to implement it. Um, just tell us a little bit about the project. 
but we are very fortunate in our community to have DEFI and all that they do for our students and our communities and families. And this was um, the vending machine came about because I just my goal and my passion is to make sure that all students have access to books. And yes, we have a great library. Most of the books are funded through Gethy, um, but I wanted another way to get books in the students' hands. So when I saw this, um, I was on a professional development um, conference and I saw it and I just, I just had to have it for our school and our students and our community because when the students earn these book tokens and it can be anything from positive behavior, a reading challenge, maybe just to put a smile on a kid's face. This could be the only book that they own personally. And it's, it's kind of neat to see it on my end because I see the excitement. I see when a student um, gets a book token and the whole class comes out and celebrates with them. And that's what makes it so special is because this is bringing a positive impact with literacy and books. And literacy is in every subject. So I think it's very important to um, promote literacy and reading because it is it's vital to our students, it's vital to our community and for future citizens um, in society. Um, I think that, you know, watching the kids' excitement and it's, it's still, you know, it's so important for these students to, to get these tokens, but it's so fun to watch them select the books. And I've even had students that came to me and said, my brother earned this, you know, got this book from last year, but now it's mine. So it's actually going home with the students and it's being passed around their family. And it also helps with parent involvement. They get excited, they sit down, they look at the book, they read the book with them and it's theirs to keep. So it's that ownership. And when they go to the book vending machine, it has nothing to do with reading level, it has nothing to do with, you know, their teacher telling them, read this book. It's all about choice, ownership. And that also brings a positive impact to, to a child with their book. Oh, gosh. And that, I mean, all the research on reading and on student interest shows that, you know, when kids get to select their own books, like that makes a world of difference in whether or not they're into reading and, and wanting to read more. Right. Yeah. So I absolutely love that. Um, I'm flipping through some of these pictures. Um, I just love the smiles on the kids' faces. I think it's so cool, you know, just uh, almost even a little subver subversive, right? To take a vending machine, something that everybody has in their mind is usually kind of associated with like, you know, controversy in a school. Like, do we really want vending machines and kids to have soda and, you know, chips and stuff like that? And to flip it and have it be such a positive thing that, um, that you want every kid to be able to do is to go to the vending machine and get a book. I just love that about it. Love the, the quote you selected to put on the side and the branding um, and the shout out to the foundation, you know, with their logo on the front. I just think this is so fantastic. Um, can you tell me just briefly a little bit about how you found the vending machine itself? Is this a special company that does this? It is. It is um, a vending machine company out of, I think, New York. Yeah. And whenever we were looking into it, we were one of the first in Oklahoma to get one in our school, and that was through the Gethy Foundation. Um, we were super excited. The kids had never seen, you know, when you know, whenever they heard about the vending machine, they were like, well, do you use quarters? You know, do we need money? Um, will there be candy in it? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's been very interesting because the kids' excitement is just, it, they're excited every time they get a token. And like I said, it could just be to put a smile on a kid's face. And that's, that's what's so exciting about it. And all of these books that we get, they're high interest. Um, being the librarian, I see what books the kids are checking out. I see what books the kids are wanting. I see um, all of this. So it makes it super fun and super interesting and exciting to select these books for the book vending machine. And Debbie also provides books for the, the book vending machine as well. Well, two different things from your application um, for the award that I love were the, the aspect of the fact that you allow donors to leave a note for a child if they donate a book, which I think is really cool. Um, and also that kids sometimes will hold on to their token waiting for a particular book to come. I love that too. Um, and as a, a reader and a parent of a reader, I'm looking at the books that I can see, um, you know, through the screen on this on this picture and thinking, yeah, there's some great stuff in here. And I'm sure that those kids are thrilled to get to get Artemis Fowl, a Wimpy Kid book. I mean, 
and like Lupica, all of these are, are fantastic options for those middle grades. So yes, they, they come into the library and they're like, are you going to restock the vending machine today? And um, what books are you going to put out there? And they do hold on to them until they just get the exact book that they've been looking forward to. And that's, that's so fun. And then they get to read little messages that teachers have written in there, people from our community, um, principals. Um, it, and other students have even donated books that they have mm -hmm. purchased and they'll bring them in. And these books are all brand new books. They are not um, used books. They're brand new books. And I think that that's another reason why it's so special. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for sharing about this today. Um, if you're watching and you're interested in learning more about this project and learning more about the vending machine, please reach out to me via email or phone and I'd be glad to connect you with Christy or with Miranda to talk a little bit more about it. Um, but thank you all so much for sharing today and congratulations on your Outstanding Program Award, much deserved, a fantastic program that I certainly hope we start to see a lot of other foundations consider replicating because it's just so much fun. Thank you. Thank you so thank much you for having us. Thanks, ladies. All right, thank you all. So I just wanna move us into Q&A if we have any, and I haven't seen any pop up, I think because you guys did such a great job of just going over everything. Um, but the same way that I um, said at the end of that video to reach out to me, um, I know we have a lot of people that watch these webinars recorded later um, because a lot of our school foundation leaders across the state of Oklahoma are volunteers who work at other jobs during the daytime. And we know from watching our YouTube count that there will be people that are watching this later. If you have more information that you're looking for from any of these programs, um, please reach out to me. I would be so glad to connect you um, with Elizabeth, with Jennifer, or with Christy and Miranda and Grove as well, and um, just to kind of learn more about the ins and outs of how they made their programs happen. Um, we sort of have an Oklahoma School Foundations Network saying, and that is that one of the great things about school foundations is that we are very collaborative. We are not in competition with one another. We all have our own communities that we serve. And so we love to steal ideas from one another and um, to take good ideas and to repurpose them and use them in our districts to help our students. And so I know that any of those ladies would be super glad to support your foundation if you like one of their um, ideas and want to implement it in your district. So any last words from anyone? Thank you no so problem. much. Thanks for Happy being to help. here. Congratulations on your Outstanding Program Awards. I'm looking forward to getting to come and present you all with your commemorative statue. And even more importantly, with your $1,000 um, uh, check with your prize money, which I know that you all will put to good use in continuing the good work in your community. So thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to share about your wonderful programs. Thank, thank you, you for the opportunity, Katie. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.